Hey team, uh, Dr. Jack Audi, how's it going? In this video, I'm gonna be taking you through selective toxicity. In the previous video, we learned how bacteria are trying to kill us. Now let's try and figure out how to kill them back. And we do this through this thing called selective toxicity. Now you must understand in the history of science, selective toxicity seems relatively obvious right now. You take a pill, it doesn't kill you, but it kills the bacteria inside of you. But the idea that there were compounds out there that could kill one organism but not another is kind of a unique and an amazing idea. It's only obvious to us because we grew up in a world with selective toxicity. But before penicillin and antibiotics and other selectively toxic agents, the idea that there's something would kill one organism but not another was a very unique idea and difficult to come to. It didn't seem that rational. The short answer of the problem is how do you kill this and without killing this? There's so many things that are the same there. You've got the ribosomes, the RNA, you've got the DNA, you've got the phospholipid membrane. How, what is special about this that is not in here? What could you possibly target given the similarities between these two organisms? How could you develop a drug that kills this but doesn't kill that? And that is a crazy idea. Um, and, you know, in a previous video, I took you through Lister's favorite chemical um, or Oxton's fam favorite chemical, and that's carbolic acid. Remember the poem, the spray, the spray, the antiseptic spray, Oxton would shower it morning, night, and day. The thing is, is carbolic, carbolic acid is very good at killing bacteria, but it also kills our cells too, and it caused chemical burns in the patients, but it was very good and much better than the alternative of having a massive bacterial infection, and it was especially good for the hands of our dried skin hands, which relatively protect us from harsh chemicals, and um, and our surgical tools, so it was an excellent, excellent sterilizing agent, but it wasn't selectively toxic. You cannot drink this. It will kill you. So we needed a selective uh, chemical. And it was uh, this guy called Paul Ehrlich. Um, he was an American, so I don't know whether to lean into that sort of German sounding name there, Paul Ehrlich. Um, and he came up with this idea that perhaps we could develop a chemical that kills one organism and not the other. He called it the magic bullet. We need to hunt out the magic bullet. I don't think he was talking about this fantastic blender of which I own. Um, I think he was talking about a gun and he was wondering, could we develop a molecular gun that would shoot one organism, perhaps a bacteria, and not a host cell like ourselves. So, you know, it wasn't until 1910 that we had really first announced this idea that we should develop a selectively toxic chemical. And that's why Paul Ehrlich is so revolutionary. Now, the story of selective toxicity um, oh, sorry, let me just explain his quote. So um, we have to learn how to aim chemically. So he's talking about that gun. Can we aim chemically? And he knew it could be done. How did he know it could be done? Because in the human body, we can do it. And <clears throat> there have been the discovery of a protein, which I'll cover in a later video, called antibodies, which are antimicrobial proteins that our bodies produce. And we knew about these proteins, and we knew that our body produces a protein that doesn't kill us, but it kills pathogens. We knew that exists. And so this gave Paul Ehrlich the idea that we could kill bacteria and not kill our own cells because our body does it. That's where that idea came from. And the story starts, well, where do you start looking? And the story actually starts in a surprising place, tar and petrochemicals, right? During the 19th century, um, uh, the mid-1800s, we'd, start we'd started to tinker with synthetic chemicals. So we weren't looking to find chemicals by grinding up um, berries or, or, or grinding up herbs. Um, and we were developing our own synthetic chemicals. Now, the impetus for this, the motivation for this, was largely dyes. We wanted synthetic dyes to stain our clothes because natural dyes were often from very expensive sources. And so we wanted to develop synthetic dyes from oil and petrol chemicals. So they would purify it out, modify it with other chemicals, and they were creating a whole range of really exciting dyes that we could now use on clothes. 
Now, biologists were thinking, let's take those dyes and stain tissues with it. So, you know, the gram stain and other kinds of stains that we've talked about, H and E stains you might have heard of. So we started to take the stains that we used in the clothing industry and apply it to biology. Now, Paul Erler noticed that some stains stained some tissues, but not others. Some cells, but not others. And he noticed one called methylene blue stained malaria much brighter than it stained our cells. So here we have red blood cells. They're a little bit blue because they've been stained with the methylene blue. And inside our red blood cells is the parasite. This is a protist parasite. It's not a bacteria. It's a eukaryote cell. Um, and inside that is a malaria protist. And it's staining really darkly with methylene blue. Now, Paul Ehrlich also knew methylene blue is toxic in high doses. There's the idea, right? There's the brilliant idea. Somehow, methylene blue, by an unknown mechanism, is concentrating in higher concentrations in the malaria, but not in our tissue. And this gave him the idea this could be a selectively toxic compound. And it was. He administered it to two people and effectively treated them for malaria. Unfortunately, it does stain our tissues and it is mildly toxic at the doses he was doing and so his patients turned blue um, but at least he treated them for malaria nearly two decades two decades so paul ehrlich then did go on to develop antibacterial an antibacterial agent it wasn't great but it was kind of good and it was based on arsenic but a really good antibacterial was developed about two decades later, and these were a sulfur drug, and these used the same idea. It was a red dye, and these would stain the patients red too, but they were noticed that the red dye stained bacteria more than human cells, and because they stained the bacteria more than human cells, and because the red dye was toxic, it was guessed that it would be selectively toxic for the bacteria, and indeed it was. Um, we just needed to get away from the idea of dyes and find chemicals that didn't also stain their patients crazy colors um, the guy that uh, discovered this actually ended up treating his daughter who had a staph infection um, on her amputated arm um, not on her arm that would have required amputation but it didn't because he treated him treated her with his red dye that was a sulfur drug but this wasn't really the magic bullet we still had um, off-target toxicity um, the sulfur drugs were mostly good for gram-positive bacteria, but not gram-negative bacteria. And so we hadn't really hit the magic bullet. Now, the magic bullet came along with Alexander Fleming in 1928 with penicillin. And you may have all heard some rumors about these stories. Like luck had something to do with it. But you may not know the extent to which luck had something to do with it. So it started with an agar plate that Alexander Fleming was preparing um, and one had become contaminated with bacteria. So he hadn't put bacteria on there, just happened to become contaminated. And he thought, why not do something fun with it? Because it's not the culture he wanted to grow. So he had a runny nose and he put some nasal mu mucus on the bacteria. Now there are some rumors that it just dripped onto the agar plate and we're not sure what the truth is. But he thought, well, why don't I see what's going on there? Because he noticed the bacteria were dying around the drip. So he popped them onto a slide and he looked at them under the microscope and he could see the bacteria pop, called, and this is called lysis. And he saw it for the first time. He saw these bacteria pop. And um, he went on and all the researchers were squirting lemons in their eyes to induce tears. And he found tears and snot contain a protein and this protein is called lysozyme. Zyme means enzyme, so it's an enzyme. Lys means to pop, so it's an enzyme that induces popping of bacteria. And this is an antibacterial enzyme found in our tears and our snot. Now, around five years later, he was investigating Staphylococcus, and he was plating up Staphylococcus on an agar plate, and he was in a bit of a hurry because he was on his way to a holiday for a holiday. He came back uh, three days later, and uh, in, we noticed one of the lids was a jar on the plate and a mold had got in and started to grow. So a lid had fallen off the plate and a mold had got in. And what was interesting is the, the kind of penicillium mold that was growing in there, that's the, name, that's the genus of the mold is penicillium. 
um, there's multiple species within that genus, um, is, is in actually a very common mold. But a floor below, in a lab, a floor below, there was uh, a penicillium mold researcher growing penicillium mold just for the sake of investigating molds, molds, not for the sake of antibacterial. So that's likely where the contamination come from. And he noticed that there was a bunch of dead bacteria around that mold. He put them under the microscope and he saw that they were lysing much in the same way that was induced by human tears, right? He said, had that tears event not occurred, he would not have recognized what was happening to the bacteria today. So there was a lot of luck involved when you think about that. You needed that research of the floor below. You needed the snot to drop onto the agar. You needed the agar plate lid, lid off. And there was a lot of um, luck into it. But essentially what he discovered was the penicillin mold was secreting penicillin, a chemical um, there that inhibits or kills bacterial growth. Now, I just said luck had a lot to do with it, but luck actually didn't have a lot to do with it. So there are lucky things that occur in any scientific discovery. If you were to take any scientific discovery and follow its history in detail, you would see quite a bit of luck involved, right? I've been lucky. All scientists can think of times that they have been lucky. Um, but one of the key things is lucky events happen all the time is to figure out what is an important result and what is worth following up in detail. And the proof of this is Louis Pasteur, over 50 years before Alexander Fleming, was growing anthrax bacillus, the bacteria, in an agar plate, and it got contaminated with mold, and he noticed that the mold was killing the bacteria, but he didn't follow it up. Now, in between Pasteur and Alexander Fleming, there were multiple people that noticed the phenomenon, and even some people who followed it up so far to inject mold extract into infected guinea pigs and cure them of bacterial diseases. But none of them pushed it. None of them realized this is the potential new magic bullet, right? And so it takes luck to make that discovery, but it takes nous and intuition and experience and intelligence to pick out that key discovery and follow it to its ultimate conclusion. It's really important, medically applicable conclusion. And proof of this is in the 1928 paper. In the 1928 paper, he says, in vitro penicillin, so penicillin was com which completely inhibits the growth of staphylococcus um, in dilutions of one to 600, does not inf interfere with leukocytic function. So a leukocyte is a white blood cell, a white blood cell from a human, so we took human white blood cells and he put penicillin on it and he showed it didn't interfere with their growth, right? The white blood cells were not killed. What he was describing was selective toxicity and he realized the treatment potential of the penicillin and followed it up. Part of what benefits all of this is that um, we soon went into World War II. They realized the medical benefits of having an antibacterial. So there was government backing behind the mass production of penicillin um, using uh, uh, yeast brewing facilities, mold brewing facilities. Okay, so how does it work? Well, here we have a uh, gram-negative bacterial cell wall. And remember, in that bacterial cell wall, we have a pep peptoglycan. We have a peptoglycan structure, and that's rigid, and that's what gives bacteria their shape. Now, it's made up of a few things. So peptid is short for peptide, which is just a small protein, which is just saying a string of amino acids. Amino acids make up peptides and proteins. A small one is a peptide, so we've got a small string of amino acids. A glycan is a long chain of sugars. So this is a long chain of sugars, and in between we've got connections of peptides. So it's a, it's a and we've got these peptides cross-linking the, the long chains of sugars. And a bacteria, to build this structure, have an enzyme called trans- peptidase. Now let's break that down. Oh, sorry, let's just say what it does. Transpeptidase builds these peptide bonds between these long sugars, right? So the transpeptidase enzyme is building the bonds between those long chains of sugars that make up the bacterial cell wall. Now, transpeptidase sounds like a big word, but trans means between. 
Peptide is short for peptides, and ase means enzyme. So it makes a lot of sense, right? It's an enzyme that builds peptides between, right? So that's a really great name. It's one of those names that's appropriate, right? So transpeptidase are building that bacterial wall. Penicillin fits into that enzyme's active site. So enzymes are just proteins that facilitate reactions, and they have these little pockets in them that are the active site that do things, right? So enzymes... I mean, a crude way to think of it is enzymes grab molecules and bring them together, or enzymes grab molecules and rip them apart if they cut things. So this uh, transpeptidase is grabbing molecules, bringing them together, forcing them to react, basically. It drops the energy required to make them react. And so it forms these peptide bonds, these uh, peptide crosslinks that crosslink the glycans and the peptides, right? So it really ties the bacterial cell wall together and penicillin gets into those pockets that's designed to grab onto the molecules. So it gets in there and blocks it. It's a little bit like if I put the wrong key in a lock and then I snap the key off, you now can't put your good key in, right? So I have blocked the active key site, so now it's not going to work anymore. And that's what penicillin does. So it blocks the formation of new bacterial cell walls. Now that's critical because bacteria are constantly remodeling their cell walls. It's not a rigid structure that stays there forever. They're repairing it, they're remodeling it. They can't do that in the presence of penicillin. But also critically, when they divide, they have to create two new cell walls, but they can't. And so they end up either as naked bacteria or very vulnerable bacteria without a cell wall, and they're very easy to die. They often lie, in fact. So this is how penicillin works. Now, here's a little bit of a scary thing. Horizontal gene transfer, we talked about this. So some bacteria have involved, evolved genes that can defend themselves from antibiotics, including penicillin. In fact, it's incredibly common. Antibacterial resistance to penicillin is very, very common to the point that penicillin isn't used a huge amount anymore because of the development of resistance. Now, it doesn't have to occur through horizontal gene transfer, but let's just imagine it does in this case. So we've got this plasmid that contains that gene, and that gene confers antibacterial resistance, and it's gone across into this bacteria. Now, that gene codes for mRNA, which then turns into protein, and that protein could be an enzyme. In fact, it could be penicillinase. Now, you should already be able to guess what this does. Ase means enzyme, penicillin, it's, a, it's an enzyme that digests penicillin. So that bacteria now has an enzyme in it, penicillinase, which can take penicillin and chop it up. So now it's inactive, right? And so the bacteria with this plasmid inside of it is more likely to survive and propagate. And so we've now essentially evolved bacteria to be resistant to penicillin because we have selected for this gene. Bacteria that have this gene survive, bacteria that don't have this gene die. So only those bacteria go on to divide. We have now selected for the bacteria that contain penicillinase. So selective toxicity is an ongoing battle and we have created multiple generations of antibacterials um, that have different molecular structures that enzymes can't break down. So then the bacteria um, through random mutation, remember it's not an active process, through random mutation, another enzyme can occur, a, a variant of an enzyme can occur that can now digest this next um, antibacterial. There are other mechanisms as well that create antibacterial resistance. So this is a huge ongoing battle and we're always researching the development of new antibacterials to fight the next wave of antibacterial resistant bacteria. So selective toxicity is ongoing today um, and it is a very exciting research field. Thank you everyone. That's it for the this video little chunk series on bacteria. Um, next up, we're going to be looking at uh, different microbes.